when we look at the ear, obviously its function is to hear. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but it also plays a role in your balance system, keeping you, you know, upright and not dizzy for the most part. If you've ever had vertigo or ever suffered with a inner ear type of issue, then uh, you can understand that the ear has a whole lot more to do than with your body than just hearing. And so that sense of balance is also important. And we'll, br we'll briefly mention that today. We won't spend much time on it. But it's important to think about the the ear from a, as a larger structure of being three smaller structures. So the outer, the middle, and the inner ear. Noting here as on the slide, it says the inner ear is also called the labyrinth. So if you've ever heard of a labyrinth, it's basically like a maze type of structure. And kind of think of the inside of the ear as a maze. Sound is, is brought into the ear. So the ear itself, the pinnae or the oracle basically catches. It's like a big catch for all of the vibe, the sound that is vibrating through the airspace. So if someone else talks, if you're listening to music or something, it's just vibrating air that gets caught by your ear and gets funneled into the middle ear. And then the, those vibrations vibrate the eardrum or tympanic membrane, which then vibrates the inner or the, sorry, the middle ear, which are those little bones inside of there. And those continue to vibrate all the way through until they connect with the cochlea. The cochlea then sends those vibrations into your auditory nerve and then sends that to your brain. And so that's how we ultimately then process those sound vibrations. But if you study sound in any way, it's just a bunch of vibrations at different frequencies. So the faster it vibrates, the higher pitch you hear and the lower it vibrates, the lower pitch you'll hear. Interestingly enough, our vocal cords are pretty similar and that when we do a high pitch type of voice, then that means our vocal cords are actually vibrating at a very rapid speed. Whereas if we get a really low voice, that means they're really slowly vibrating. And then that just vibrates the air at that different pitch and the person who hears that, hears it at that slower pitch because of the, the speed or rate of those vibrations and how it gets transferred then to our brains. So here we see uh, the blow up of the anatomy of the ear on page 355, making note of the delineations down here at the bottom showing the external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. These anatomical features or structures are listed on the next page 556. Uh, there's just a smaller picture of that there, but if you wanna follow along with the slide that's on your screen and then the chart that's in your text, um, you can find the definitions for these items. But for the most part, the outer ear is fairly simple. Again, it's just the oracle or the pinna, which is like the fleshy part of the ear that hangs off your head. And then the meatus is the opening or the sort of ear canal, if you will, that runs all the way down to the tympanic membrane. And that tympanic membrane is what the doctor's looking at when they take that scope and they look through it into your ear for an ear infection. And that's what they're actually looking at. And that membrane is a seal essentially from the outer ear to the middle ear. And it helps to keep everything that might get into your ear out of that. There's also some glands out here in this outer ear section that produce your earwax. And of course the earwax is there along with ear hairs to kind of filter out any debris that might get into the ear canal that should not. And then it's a way to sort of gum up that debris and then move it out of the ear canal, ideally, so that it doesn't plug up your ear. Of course, most people deal with an ear, a plugged ear at some point because of earwax or something like that, and that can be problematic. The middle ear then made up of this bony structure that includes the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, also known as the hammer malleus. Think of like mallet like a hammer, like being a mallet. The incus as the anvil, as it's often called, the anvil. So if you think about a blacksmith, like forging a sword, putting it in the hot iron, hot fire, and then hammering it, they're using a mallet and an anvil to hammer that, that steel flat to make a sword. So you can think about the hammer and then the anvil, and then the stapes is often called the stirrup because you can kind of look at it. It sort of looks like a stirrup hanging off of a saddle and you could put your foot right into there. Again, vibrations from the tympanic membrane are vibrating through the hammer. The hammer beats on the anvil. The anvil sends those vibrations to the stirrup. 
and then the stirrup connects to the cochlea and that ultimately is what travels those vibrations through that inner ear and then onto your cranial nerve. So then moving to your inner ear, and we see the stirrup does connect to the cochlea, and then we have these semicircular canals up here on top. And those are important for some of your balance issues. And there's also some fluid inside of the vestibule and the semicircular canals that play a, a large role in your, in your balance. So if you ever have vertigo or are having balance issues, it could be an inner ear problem. When, you know, most people, when we talk about ears, it's like, okay, well, something to do with an ear infection. And that's kind of like the most common thing that we see. Usually what happens with an ear infection is for some reason, this eustachian tube. And so this eustachian tube just drains down to your pharynx. It allows any fluid in this area of the ear to drain down into the back of your throat. So then it can be swallowed or spit out. And that's just a way of keeping it clean and, and keeping the body fresh and moving. But if it gets plugged up with something or like you go swimming and maybe some swallow some water and some water gets pushed up into your eustachian tube and then it plugs up and you get this like lake water up there, it can become infected that in goo, then the pus can cause a blockage of that. And then you would need to be on an antibiotic in order to clean up and kill this bacteria in order to open that eustachian tube back up so it can start clearing once more. When that happens, typically what we see then is this tympanic membrane gets really angry as well. And it gets all red and bothered by the infection that's inside of there. And that's typically how we're gonna diagnose it. A lot of the symptoms of the ear infection will be very similar to lots of other infection symptoms that we see. So it's hard to sort of like rule that out unless you sort of feel like that, oh yeah, just kind of, there's this weird feeling in your ear. And a lot of times you'll see babies kind of tugging at their ear. And then if you look with an otoscope at the tympanic membrane, you can actually see that, yeah, it's red and angry. And so it looks like there's a, it's a problem and maybe there's some fluid back there that's built up and not draining appropriately. And so then you would know that, 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 they, have an inner ear, that they have an ear infection. And so that's typically what we see most frequently in healthcare with ears. If your patient, especially your kids have recurring ear infections, then usually what's happening is this eustachian tube is just so small as they're developing. It's just not good at draining the fluid because it is just so tiny in kids. So what happens then is the doctor will come in and they'll cut a little hole. They'll poke a hole through your tympanic membrane and they'll put us basically like a little stent in there. They'll put a little tube in there to keep that hole open. What that does is it allows any fluid that's in the ear to now drain out of the ear because this eustachian tube isn't quite effective. Now, typically as kids grow, even to from six months to a year and a half, year and a half to two and a half, to even a year later after having tubes, a lot of times they won't have to have the tubes redone because their ear canal eustachian tube has actually grown to the point where it is now functioning, whereas before it wasn't. And then these tubes themselves at some point just fall out and then work themselves out of the ear canal and don't not, a, it's not a problem if they fall out, that tympanic membrane will eventually heal itself back up and it's no longer needed. That is like the main medical aspects, like the high frequency issues that you're going to see with the ear. Understanding there are some other issues that we'll briefly touch on here throughout the the course today. So we talked about these already from the external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. And again, those are on 556 and 557. You guys can see the actual definitions of any of those. Note that those three bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup are called ossicles in combination. So if you just say the ossicles of the ear, you're talking about those three bones. And here that is blown up. You can see the malleus incus and the stape stapus or hammer, anvil, and stirrup. It's usually a lot easier and to, to remember and to say hammer, anvil, and stirrup than it is the malleus, incus, and stapus. Kind of just a way to remember that order. Hammer is the first thing that you, if you're going to hit something, the hammer is the first thing that needs to move. So the hammer goes first. What does the hammer hit? It hits the anvil and then the anvil then sends vibrations through the stirrup. 
that might be helpful, maybe not. Inside the ear then looking at the cochlea and we'll talk a briefly about like what a cochlear implant looks like as well. And then the semicircular canals and the vestibule. And then lastly, like the mastoid bone. So the mastoid bone, you can see it, like if you look at your pictures on 556 or even the one on 555, they're showing like that bone behind the ear canal is, is mastoid bone. But really, like if you're looking at my video right now of my feed, this bone right back here is that mastoid bone. So it's behind, you know, your pinna or your auricle. And if you're just kind of tapping, there's almost like a knob there. That's the, your mastoid bone. And so that's what is there behind the actual ear canal and kind of wraps the ear itself. Here's a, a blow up of the inner ear and I'm labeling some different parts. And you can see that they've labeled the semicircular canal as the anterior, the lateral and the posterior seg segments of that, as well as showing the ampulla and the capula as part of the posterior semicircular canal. This stuff's not listed in your text. This is just kind of a, a blown up area of the cochlea noting the cochlear nerve and then the vestibular nerves. And those are then of course, what are going to then come together to join into the cranial nerve that takes the auditory information to your brain. Here's another one of these good sort of uh, cascading images showing the pathway of sound going from outside to in with the ear. It's pretty straightforward. It's basically what we would expect oracle. So the external ear into the ear canal going to the tympanic membrane and then through the ossicles, so hammer, anvil, and then stirrup. Stirrup connects to the oval window. So this spot here is the oval window of the cochlea, and that's where the stirrup connects. So where we saw the oval window on the previous page, uh, previous picture, that's where the stirrup is connecting. And then from there, it's inside of the cochlea and then passes its way through the acoustic nerve which again, it's the cochlear nerve as well as the nerves from your vestibules. Again, here's those vestibular nerves. And then here's that oval window where the stirrup is going to be connecting to it to make that bridge between the middle ear and the inner ear. Looking at our combining forms of the ear. So there's not a lot of anatomy with the ear. We've listed all of the anatomical parts of the ear already. So this, this section hopefully is a little bit lighter for you guys and, and easier because there's just not that many anatomical parts. It's pretty similar to the eye in that respect. You know, when we see anything like audi or audio, that's of course referring to any type of noise or sound. One thing that you might see a lot is the difference between the the vision system, the eye and the ear. So with the eye, remember it was like opt, like optometrist or ophthalmic. You've got the op, there's a P in there. And that's when, whenever there's a P in that op type of sound, you know that it refers to the eye system. But if there's not that P in the word, like if it's auto or oto, then it's referring to the ear. So autology doesn't have the P in there, so that's the ear. But ophthalmology has the P in there. So that's referring to the eye. So that P is kind of like the instigating factor there to dis differentiate between the eye and the ear. Because sometimes you can get some of these words confused. Is that the eye or the ear? I don't really remember. That's one way to remember it. Here we can see, again, these combining forms, cochlea, labyrinth, mastoid, moringo, which we'll talk about on the next slide because we haven't talked about that yet. Stape, so again, stapus, that's the stirrup and vestibulo. So again, all of these words we've already sort of seen and used based off the anatomy, so it's really easy to understand those. Tympano, typically, if it's listed, is talking about the middle ear. So if it's a tympano, whatever, and that's typically regarding to the middle ear, but also referring to the tympanic membrane. Moringo is typically relating to the tympanic membrane itself. So even though the tympanic membrane is itself, when you say tympano in a word, it's typically that whole middle ear section. But if we wanna speak specifically about the tympanic membrane, then we use the term moringe or moringo, kind of a note about that. And then labyrinth or labyrintho, referring to the inner ear, because the cochlea tends to resemble somewhat of a labyrinth or a maze inside of it. So looking at some disease or disorder terms that are built from these word parts that we've just been looking at, Again, really common itis. We know there's inflammation there of, of the labyrinth or the cochlea in this case. 
mastoiditis, so the inflammation of that bone that's behind um, the ear, so that's sort of encasing the ear. Ringitis, okay, so this would be a tympanic membrane inflammation specifically. Otalgia, again, that algia is the pain, and ot, ot is for ear, so just ear pain is a kind of a fancy way to say my ear hurts or I've got ear pain. And a lot of times if you have um, an ear infection, then a kid will complain of ear pain or like their ear is bothering them. The medical term for that would be otalgia. Note that even though there are lots of fancy medical terms for lots of this stuff, physicians and healthcare workers oftentimes are just speaking in layman's terms because that's the way our patients speak. And very rarely will we be referring to ear pain as otalgia. If we were doing surgery and we were writing it up, then we're probably going to use some pretty specific terms regarding the surgery itself. But even then describing a symptom like ear pain, it's unlikely that you're going to use otalgia on a consistent basis. So even though there are medical terms for lots of things, that doesn't mean we always use them the majority of the time. Automastoiditis. Here again, we're kind of going back to our exercises of breaking these words up. We can see that we've got the three different parts here. So we know that we have inflammation of the mastoid bone and the ear in general. So the automastoiditis is just showing you that, yeah, you've got the ear and the mastoid bone in general that's being inflamed. Mycos mycosis, so ear and then pus and osis, so disease or infection um, in involving pus of the ear. Auto, actually, I'm sorry, not, um, I got ahead of myself. The, the pi orea, pi is pus, the my is not. So scratch that from your memory as if I didn't say it. The mycosis would be fungal in orientation. So fungal ear infection, whereas pi is just referring to a pus. So you could get pus from like a bacterial infection, viral infection different types where myco is, is very specific to the fungus. So autopyorrhea, remember rhea meaning flow. So you have pus flow out of the ear as opposed to just autorrhea where you just have ear drainage. Like an example of this, our one-year-old had tubes in and right after getting the tubes in, all of a sudden he's got this like yellow pussy stuff draining out of his ear. Well, that is alarming, right? But it's a good thing because that means that tube is working. That junky fluid that's in the ear that normally would cause a massive infection and need to go on antibiotics once again, because this was like the fifth time, is now draining out of the ear, even though it looks bad. It's like, oh no, there's something wrong with them. It's like, no, that's, that's proper. That's a good thing because that means that tube is working and his ear's not going to get infected because now that fluid is draining out of the ear. And that would be an otorrhea. Sclerosis, remember, is a hardening. Autosclerosis typically referring to inner ear issues and hardening of the, uh, the stirrup and the uh, malleus and the incus as it connects to the cochlea, so middle and inner ear. Those types of exercises, like exercise six there on page 560, will basically be breaking those words down into their prefix, root, and suffix. Uh, these disorder terms not built from word parts can be a little bit challenging. The ones that we use on a regular basis are pretty straightforward. But the ones that we don't, it's just a matter of basically going to have to come to this list at five, on page 561 and, and look these up to see what they actually mean um, because they are, you know, they don't make a whole lot of sense. Now, acoustic neuroma, we know OMA, of course, for like a tumor. And so that makes, you know, acoustic neuroma, that makes some type of auditory system tumor. You know, we can, we can make that out somewhat. Caramunoma, again, another OMA type of word. But the caramine... This is where we start talking about the um, earwax glands that are secreting the ear, the solution that is going to become your earwax. And that was not listed in sort of the anatomical introduction in this chapter. So when you see that cerumen oma, then think of that as the glands that are secreting the earwax fluid that is going to harden up and become your earwax. Cholesteatoma. So here we've got a couple of words that seemingly we've seen before. If you remember like Cholest, so like cholesterol or steat, again, meaning like a fat or a lipid, and oma, so a tumor involving like a fatty type of tissue. Miniary disease, uh, remember like in uh, chapter one, we looked at those type two categories and we said there was some eponyms that were people's names 
as well as English words and acronyms. So here we see like a kind of a weird word, meonary disease, talking about a chronic disease of the inner ear. Otitis externa, ot, ear, itis, inflammation of the external ear. Otitis media, which is the most common thing that we're going to see is that inflammation of the middle ear or ear infection of the middle ear. And that's usually that tympanic membrane being involved as well as the eustachian tube. But this one right here is most commonly used. Oftentimes you'll see it written in charts as OM. Also, if it's acute otitis media, sometimes they'll put an A in front of it. Most otitis medias are an acute otitis media, but then as they come recurrent, then they'll, they'll become like a chronic otitis media. But a lot of times people just use OM. Tinnitus and vertigo are two other pretty common words. Um, we see a lot of advertisements right um, now for tinnitus. And that just is like that ringing in your ears. Like if you've ever been laying down and then you just like everything's silent, but you hear this ringing in your ears. Like to some extent, there's a little bit of that that's normal. But if it's just like super loud and it's causing a major issue, then that would be consider considered tinnitus. Sometimes there's a pressure change, and I, I didn't mention this, but the eustachian tube is also instrumental. Like when we change pressures and elevation in equalizing those pressures between our middle ear and the, the outside environment, having a clogged eustachian tube will cause, will just wreak havoc on you if you're flying and changing elevations rapidly. Um, so that's why you kind of like do this thing with your jaw and try to open it up or chew gum or try to do something like that yawning in order to try to open up that eustachian tube a little bit to let that pressure equalize. So in that, sometimes you might just be at your house doing whatever, and then all of a sudden it just, it just feels like something changes in your earring and you hear this loud ringing for no reason whatsoever. Something has changed, like the barometric pressure outside may have changed to several millimeters of mercury, and then all of a sudden your ears finally adjust to that. And it's not enough that you really recognize it like you would in an airplane. But then all of a sudden it pops or it lets go. And then all of a sudden you sort of hear this ringing for a few moments as a result of that. Vertigo is that imbalance due to the middle and inner ear issues. So the vestibular and cochlear portions of the ear where that fluid actually is. Middle ear, not so much unless you've got that plugged up eustachian tube. Here's a couple pictures of, of the ear. Now this is the otitis externa. So this is the outside of the ear. Now, if you look deep inside, you can see the tympanic membrane. So this portion right here is your tympanic membrane that you can see. It actually doesn't look too reddened and inflamed. I know it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but it actually looks more almost clearish or like sort of like candle wax that's white. But the outside of the ear canal is what we're concerned with here. And this is where you've got something causing a havoc in the outside of the ear canal. So that would be like an otitis externa. Otitis media, this is what your tympanic membranes are going to look like. And this is on page 562. Ear infection, positive on the left, negative on the right. So the right, this picture B, is what your ear tympanic membrane should look like when the doctor looks through the otoscope at it. And you can see it's, it's sort of like nice and clear. There might be some fluid back there, but even here, this does not look like there's any fluid. This is nice and clear, this white spot is just a reflection from the light source in the otoscope. And then this is part of your malleus that's connecting to the tympanic membrane. Looking over at the right hand, or I'm sorry, the left hand side, you can see much different perspective. You've got, here's this sort of like white patch over here, which reflects with over here. But now you've got all of this red spot over here, which could be fluid or just inflamed tissue. And then all of this is also inflammation. And so your hammer is inflamed in this case, or the fluid surrounding the hammer by the tympanic membrane is, in, is causing inflammation. And so that's where you're seeing this sort of red and angry eardrum. All right, so going back to um, some surgical terms, built from word parts. Uh, again, uh, nothing too abnormal when we looked at the ectomies. Okay, remember, ectomy is that excision, ec excision. You can think of like if E-E-C-T. Um, I always like to think E-X because excision. When I think of ectomy as opposed to otomy, which is just cutting, cutting a hole or uh, into that area. So it's excising or just cutting into it. 
plasty, uh, meaning of course repair. And so we see all of these different terms and then it's just that different word root that we've been looking at. So Meringo, uh, remember that is regards to the tympanic membrane, membrane specifically. So if we're gonna put tubes in a patient, then we're gonna be doing a meringotomy and then inserting the tube itself. If you had a blown eardrum, sometimes that happens with industrial workers or if you're exposed to super loud noise or something like that, you might blow your eardrum. Someone is in there smashing it with a Q-tip or a pen or a crayon or something, which they shouldn't be, then you, they would have to have a meringeoplasty done in order to, to fix that. So words like mastoidectomy and mastoidotomy, they're not removing the entire bone. They're just removing parts of that bone or making a cut into parts of that bone in order to see what's going on. Here is a picture, not in your text, but that I brought in showing you what a cochlear implant looks like. Of course, we know the cochlear inner ear. The implant itself is this device that they'll cut a hole in your scalp and they'll come in here and so they'll do a mastoidotomy and then they're going to put a They'll do a mastoidotomy and they'll place the receiver part of your cochlear implant here on the inside of the bone and of your scalp. So it's inside. And then there's a transmitter that's on the outside that usually runs up and over the ear and sits there. And that's what's sort of like your microphone. It's receiving all of the noise and then it transmits it through to the receiver the receiver then transmits it through these wires that run down and into the cochlea. And then that then allows that sound to interact with the nerve, which then gets sent to the brain and the patient can hear. So it basically they're replacing this portion of your ear with this cochlear implant. And so they just kind of bypass this because for whatever reason, typically the middle ear, so something with the tympanic membrane, the hammer, um, anvil and stirrup is not functioning, but the cochlea is still functioning and the nerves are still functioning. So if they can just get it into there, that'll work. And so oftentimes, and this is what you see um, patients with cochlear implants look like. Um, and it's just basically sutured into their scalp. And then this is the device that's working as that microphone in order to pass that information through. Here's a uh, graphic of a, a meringotomy, so just cutting into the tympanic membrane, and here they're showing some nice pus draining out of it, which is typically what you, is what you would see with an ear infection that they're unable to, to heal through normal uh, means. So some diagnostic terms built from word parts. Most of this has to do with sort of like looking in the ear with a scope or using some type of graphical cording device to see how the ear is actually doing. So we have the, the words like gram and graphy enabled that are going to give us like readouts of what's going on inside of the ear. And then we have the scope and scopy, like the otoscope or the otoscopy is just the, the act of using an otoscope looking in the ear. And then tympanometer and tympanometry, obviously then looking at the tympanic membrane more specifically. Again, words that we've been accustomed to these last couple of weeks as far as diagnostic terms, and then just these new word roots for about the ear today. Here's kind of an example of an audiogram. If you've ever had your ears tested or taken a child in to have their ears tested, you know, they sit in the booth with the headphones on and then the audiologist is in there asking them questions. Like if you hear a noise, raise your hand, or if you hear this, do this, or, you know, and, and so you go through that process and that's eventually what comes out so that they can quote, test your hearing. Complementary terms to the ear, so audiologist, we just used that one and audiology being the study of the ear. Audiologist, of course, is the person who does the work. Aural or A-U-R-A-L is just another term for sound. So you'll, you'll hear that term every once in a while re referring to that. Cochlear, not necessarily complementary, but something that is actually inherent to the ear system. Autologist and autology, again, aut, um, aut, <laughs> Otorhinolaryngologist. These are OTS words, so these are all ear doctors to some sort or an ear specialist um, study of the ear. Um, this this otorhinolaryngologist. Sorry, it's a hard word to say. This is that's why we just call these doctors ENTs, ear, nose, and throat. Because if we look at what this word actually breaks down to mean, we see OT in its combining form with the O. So ear, 
And then we see rhino, we know that that's the nose and larynx for the throat. So ear, nose, throat, ologist, person who studies the ear, nose, and throat. And so that's where we get E and T from. If you have someone who also includes the I in that, which sometimes you do, you'd have an E, E, and T, or eyes, ears, nose, and throat. But a lot of times we see the, the I people specialize and then the E and T specialize. And so that's kind of a, a divide there usually. And then vestibular, vestibulocochlear, again, just the vestibules and the cochlear combining the two and vestibular just referring straight to the vestibules themselves and not doing a combination. And then finishing off with the abbreviations, here's the ENT, EENT. We talked about acute otitis media, the being that first one on the list there, and then the bottom one just being regular otitis media as well. So not a whole lot of abbreviations with this list, but they were already used within the chapter already. I know that that's kind of quick, kind of like the I was, but there are short chapters, and so no reason to make them longer than they, they need to be.